the Colossus and Majestic class carriers were a classic example of a wartime rush program, accidentally resulting in some of the most versatile and long-lived ships to ever sail the Seven Seas. The losses incurred by carriers in the early part of World War II, along with the ever-expanding number of operational theatres and increasing numbers of new threats, meant the Royal Navy was very rapidly coming to the realisation that they needed a lot of carriers, and they needed them fast. However, the needed air groups, and more critically the speed of operations, were significantly higher than what the early model escort and merchant aircraft carriers could provide. And, without access to the standard template construct pattern for the Essex class, a number of other options needed to be considered. Older cruisers could be stripped and converted, or faster and larger civilian ships such as liners could be used. A third option was for a new design of carrier, based on the unarmoured, cheap and fast-built escort carriers, but larger, and hopefully a bit faster. By the end of 1941, the latter option had been chosen as the most efficient, since converting cruisers took them off the front lines and would result in smaller air groups on ships with worn-out machinery, and the merchant conversion option would remove valuable fast transports from the equation. Therefore, as a stepping stone between the escort carrier and the fleet carrier, the term light fleet carrier was eventually agreed upon, after a number of other titles had been considered. Working from the illustrious class armoured carrier and scaling down by removing the armour, shortening the ship and changing the build standard from military to a civilian military hybrid, they managed to arrive at a vessel that displaced just over 13,000 tonnes at standard displacement with a 25 knot top speed coming from 40,000 shaft horsepower that drove two propeller shafts, with an overall size and displacement approximating the USS Wasp and actually larger than the ostensible fleet carrier HMS Eagle. The ships weren't expected to last very long, with most predictions being that they would either be lost in action, scrapped or replaced within three years of coming into service. Initially, the order was for a 16-strong Colossus class, with work beginning in February 1942. Various design changes and delays meant that even though many of the hulls began to hit the water in late 1943, only four ships of the original configuration would be ready by the end of the Second World War. The Colossus, Glory, Venerable and Vengeance, with another four still undergoing work. But what about the other eight? Well, two of them, Perseus and Pioneer, were converted into aircraft maintenance carriers to support frontline operations. This picked up on the idea that had been started by the Unicorn class, with the two ships omitting most of the facilities and equipment that were associated with combat aircraft launch, control and recovery, in favour of more space for storing and repairing, as well as testing aircraft. The idea being that they could cycle new and repaired aircraft to the frontline carriers, and take in and repair damaged ones far faster and more efficiently than a long supply line back to shore in the Pacific. Well, that accounts for ten ships, but what about the last six? As aircraft and technology had advanced massively, the last six ships were effectively redesigned to account for this. Almost all aircraft-related aspects from the flight deck strength to the power of the catapults, the loading of the lifts, and the breakpoint of the arrestor cables had to be ramped up. New weapons and radar were installed, and dedicated equipment for at-sea resupply was also t taken into account. Now, with the ships pushing close to 15,000 tonnes standard displacement and over 20,000 tonnes at full displacement, the ships were reclassified as the Majestic class, of which one, the Leviathan, would never actually be fully complete. Another eight even further improved variants were planned, but ever-evolving technological and tactical developments meant that this was ditched in favour of a separate, larger design. After some changes to the parking arrangements, the final World War II-era air group of 48 aircraft was established, with a capacity for 52 if they went with a largely fighter-based configuration with fewer of the larger strike aircraft. Critically, the hangar height was 17.5 feet, much higher than on many of the armoured carriers, albeit not quite as high as on an Essex. These hangars, which allowed for larger aircraft to be accommodated, would be critical in their post-war careers. The only gun armament on the ships were a mix of 40mm pom-pom, 20mm orlikon and 40mm bofors in various combinations and numbers depending on the time and the ship in question.
After the war, the Colossus-class ships would be used for a number of critical experiments in new carrier technology, including the fielding of new aircraft, the first jet aircraft landing on a carrier, the new angled flight deck, and an interesting side development looking to see if rubber flight decks instead of solid ones were the way forward. The then new steam catapult would also be tested aboard HMS Perseus. The class would see limited action in the Korean War alongside the larger US Navy contingent, and then in the Suez Crisis, now acting as helicopter assault ships as opposed to the Korean action where they'd served as actual aircraft carriers. In the Royal Navy, the ships would gradually be taken out of service and scrapped in the 1950s and 60s, except for HMS Triumph, which was converted to a repair vessel. But what about the Majestic class? Well, none of these would see Royal Navy service, as the budgets were cut, all five complete Majestics and eventually four of the eight full carrier versions of the Colossus class would be sold on to other navies instead, making them the most widely operated class of fleet carrier ever built. This list would include HMS Colossus serving with the French Navy as the Aromanche, HMS Venerable serving with the Dutch Navy as Carl Dorman and then heading over to Argentina as the 25 de Mayo, HMS Vengeance retaining its name and serving with the Australian Navy before heading off to the Brazilian Navy, renamed Minas Gerais, HMS Warrior serving with the Canadian Navy, again keeping its name, and then, like its sister ship, heading to the Argentine Navy as the Independencia, Majestic and Terrible served with the Australian Navy as Melbourne and Sydney, Magnificent kept her name and served with the Canadian Navy, Hercules served with the Indian Navy as Vikrant, and Powerful transferred to the Canadian Navy as Bonaventure. For ships designed to last three years, they proved exceptionally long-lived, with the Brazilian and Indian ships physically lasting into the 21st century, with Minas Gerais only leaving service in 2001, and Vikrant, although leaving active service in the 1990s, would not be scrapped until 2014. That's it for this video. Thanks for watching. If you have a comment or suggestion for a ship to review, let us know in the comments below. Don't forget to comment on the pinned post for dry dock questions.